You are listening to a Clark's World Magazine podcast with your host and narrator, Kate Baker. Greetings, Clark's World citizens. I hope this podcast finds you extraordinarily well. It's our second to last story for the month of June 2017, issue 129, and the piece is titled Human Error by Jay Lake. The late and great Jay Lake was a highly talented and prolific writer who, during his tragically short career, seems to have managed to sell to nearly all the markets in the business, appearing with short work in Asimov's Interzone, Tor.com, Clark's World, Strange Horizons, Aeon, Postscripts, Electric Velocipede, and many other markets. Lake was also an acclaimed and prolific novelist. He also won the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer in 2004. Jay Lake died in 2014. You can still find the many works that Jay Lake did over at his website, jlake.com. And that's J-L-A-K-E. He's appeared in Clark's World numerous times before. February 2007 brought you Chewing Up the Innocent. March 2008 brought you The Sky That Wraps the World Round, Past the Blue and Into the Black. February 2010 brought you Torquing Vacuum. And January 2015 brought you An Exile of the Heart. And this, this right here is why it's important to preserve the legacy. And we do that here at Clark's World by offering reprints, such as this particular story from Jay Lake. So if you find this to be important to you, head over to patreon.com forward slash Clark's World, where you can find wonderful ways to keep this magazine going, from not just the original fiction writers in the genre, but for those who we've lost. So I invite you to sit back, relax, and let me tell you a story. Lapette worked the mineral vein by hand. There were machines, of course, but they weren't always suitable. This was a narrow, rotten course of pyrochlor, loaded with niobium and tantalum. It corkscrewed through the asteroid like a drunk on a crotch rocket. Automated equipment didn't work well with too many irregular vector changes. A rockhead with a hot tip and a trowel, on the other hand, could follow it just fine. She didn't mind, really. Outside work kept her away from the habitat. Ever since Malibu died, Alain had been insufferable. Tenelu had been a shit from the beginning of the tour. Being rock boss had gone to his head. The mining crews didn't try to bring in bulk ores, siderophilic chunks of mantle, for example. Those were tagged with screamer beacons and left for the grab-and-drop operators that cruised the belt on their own long, slow schedules. Their job was to locate and harvest the rare minerals, valuable material in small quantities that didn't show up well on remote scans or fast sensor sweeps. Any chunk of rock with something else inside it had a chance of being important. This pyrochlor was the fabled something else. The loose vein was shifting again, trending into the third octant from the local Z orientation. Time to cut another length of access tunnel. She clipped her hot tip and a trowel to the capture bag and carefully worked them down her back tunnel to the closest void. Lapid's handheld rock burner was stowed there. Their rock, 217496, 2078 HJ3, was a chunky mass of carbonatite, crustal material, an unusual find with a high potential for rare earths and a number of scarce materials. They'd found a few scattered caltrops in some of the surface crevices, also a good sign. In addition, the asteroid had several naturally occurring voids, which was also unusual. Out in the belt, rocks with good structural integrity tended to become smaller rocks. <sighs> kind of like what happens to people, she thought. Alain was flying apart. Tanalu had been nothing but a monoblock of shitheadedness. Lapette wondered what the theory meant for her. The good thing about the voids was she didn't have to back all the way up the tunnel every time she needed an equipment change. The alternative was to burn out a stowage cave, but the company strongly discouraged that. Sari's mineral resources took the view that extracting bubbles of hot rock from their precious real estate was a health and safety risk. More to the point, they were afraid of slagging something of material value. 
rockheads such as La Pet Ugarte were not considered to have significant material value. She was still just as happy to be down here by herself. If she'd been running one of the remotely operated burners, she'd be back in the hab sharing oxygen with a couple of very difficult men. La Pet shifted the handheld burner back up her access tunnel. It was a heavy beast, massing over 100 kilograms. Tiny reaction jets positioned and stabilized the equipment when it was running, but she wasn't supposed to relocate it while there was any power to the systems. She'd seen a couple of burner accidents early on. That was one safety precaution almost everyone bought into. She aimed the burner roughly along her desired line of cut. There was an imager mounted to the handlebars to check the working path of her voids, insertions or boundaries in the rock matter itself. The imager caused the handlebars to vibrate slightly. Her faceplate offered a data feed, and even distribution on radargram would mean a clean cut. Anything else would mean wrestling the damned burner back down to the last void and going in by hand. She wouldn't even use the hot tip if there were another void ahead. It would be all hero, hand extraction of rebel overhang. The problem with voids was that they might contain gas, Cutting into one with a handheld burner carried a potential for more excitement than any rockhead wanted to meet on an outside shift. The radargram showed a substantial void, with metallic inclusion to boot. Damn, she'd be half her shift, cutting into that one the hard way. On the other hand, she could bring up all her stowage once she opened up the space. Her earbud whined. Hardvac 3, do you need assistance? It was Tanalu. He must have been monitoring her audio feed. Tanaloo could be rough and ready whenever it pleased him to be, but when it came to Lapit, he was nothing but by the book all the time. She had enough infraction notices from him to fill a kit bag by way of proof. Negative, rock control. Then cut the chatter. Rock control out. Right. Hard vac three out. You anal purge valve, she mouthed into her faceplate though there was almost certainly a code for that buried somewhere in the company man pages, her saying out loud wouldn't have been so much by the book. There was no helping what lay before her. La Pet shifted the burner back down her access tunnel, then set to work the old-fashioned way. There was a reason rockheads still called themselves miners. Even out here in the deep dark, amid their cocoons of remote operating controls and life support and company regulations. In the end... It somehow always came down to shovels and picks. La Pet labored three hours in silence, punctuated only by the ragged sound of her own breathing. The carbonatite was fairly soft. It broke easily and she could push it back by hand. The trick in such a small tunnel was removing the spoil with a timing that balanced between efficiency of effort and not blocking herself in. All in a shift's work. Flexors and tensors in the fabric of her skin suit braced against her muscles so she could move in the asteroid's microgravity. The tools seemed to be extensions of her arms, dagger, sharp fingers, and shovel-bladed hands. It was work, in the purest sense, combining the physical strain of gym time back in one of the rock ports and the thoughtful process of setting her next strike pulling her next load. Based on her reading of the radargram, now cached in her faceplate's processors for reference, La Pet needed to remove less than three stairs of rock to open her tunnel into the void. Her dig plan was to work the full two meters of access tunnel rather than open an exploratory shaft. She would only have bothered with that if she'd thought there was any serious chance of a gas outflow. The two other voids she'd opened so far flowing the pyrochlory run had been a vacuum. The metallic inclusion was more on her mind. The signature didn't make a lot of sense. Too dense and small to be an ore vein. She assumed it was a nodule that had gotten caught in the original lava flows that laid down this carbonatite, but back when the rocks were still part of planet Marduk. Sometimes she wondered if they remembered those days with slow, silicate thoughts. Did rocks no regret? It took her a moment to realize she was hearing Hélène's voice in her earbuds. Busy here, rock control, dismissing her fantasies of thinking rocks. She was close to breaking in. Dust fogged her lights. 
She needed to run a sweeper soon before her sight lines were too occluded. Antenna lose asleep. Elaine sounded dreamy, unfocused. She leaned against the shaft of her robin shovel and let her heart rate settle. The slight plucking sensation of the skin suit wicking away her sweat was pleasant. Elaine, maybe you need to sleep too. Oh, you've been out a long time. There was a definite sing-song quality to his voice. Come home before I lock the door and turn out the lights. That was a threat. And then, damn Malibu for getting himself killed. Who could have known his love was the lock that kept Alain's head case tendencies shut safely away? Well, the Ceres Mineral Resources site group for one. Lapette thought for a few moments. He couldn't lock her out, not literally. All airlocks open from the outside with a purely mechanical bypass. Rescue is more important than piracy, even to rock pirates. She was suited up for vac now, so whatever turning out the lights meant to Ellen, it wouldn't affect her immediately. Unless he dumped their habitat's life support or purged its fuel cells, there wasn't much she couldn't readily recover from. So it wasn't a threat, just an annoyance. At least to her. Some stir of conscience troubled Lapette. Alain, can I talk to Tanalu? My name is Rock Control, sweetie. In that case, my name is Hardvac 3. She toggled the haptics in her left glove and made Tanalu's hand sign. The habitat's central systems would send him an alarm. He'd be pissed at her for waking him up, but whatever color Alain's sky was at the moment, it wasn't the honest black of the deep dark. Someone needed to pay attention. Alain's voice was jittery now. Had he been crying? Well, okay, but come back soon. I miss you. Hardvac 3 out, Lepet said brusquely. Elaine was on another Malibu jag. Stupid luck was the leading cause of mortality among rockheads. Human error ran a close second. The company classed those two together, though any miner who ever shipped out of a rock port could swear to the power of luck, both good and bad. Psych-outs were the third leading cause, her conscience whispered. She was out here, Elaine was in there, and Tanalu could handle him. As long as her workflow was already interrupted, Lepet ran the sweeper. When she'd cleared much of the dust, she resumed digging her face. The pyrochlor waited. Lepet broke into the void a few minutes later. There was a swirl in the dust. Possibly some small amount of gas had been trapped within. More likely it was volatiles condensing in the energy input of her lights. She worked the opening until it was large enough to peer through. This void looked just like the others had, a relatively smooth-walled bubble in the original igneous flow. There was a dark patch on the far wall, over a meter away from her breakthrough. She couldn't see how high up the void went. There were probes for this sort of measurement, but this was mining, not science. She meant to complete the process of extending her digging. Lepet used her number three recoilless pick to widen the opening until it was large enough to serve as the next frame of her tunnel. She took another run with the sweeper, then stepped inside. The void ran almost three meters along her current y-axis and was slightly over two meters across. Lepet aimed her lights upward. A darker line across the nominal ceiling showed the transit of the pyrochlor vein, she then looked at the patch on the opposite wall. It was metal. A mass of metal about the size of a small child with planed and curved surfaces and a regularity of form which began to frighten her. Worked metal inside an asteroid? With the same strange gray-green sheen of the caltrops, which the rockheads found from time to time in sheltered spots, cracks, caves, and voids, all around the belt... Everyone said those were crystals of some kind. This was undeniably a made thing. Rock control, she whispered. We have a problem. Lapette backed out slowly, careful not to touch anything else inside the void, or indeed the tunnel. One by one, she turned out her lights.
The habitat was staked to one flank of 217-496-2078-HJ3. It was a large inflatable module designed to be stowed for long-haul transport, or simply towed from location to location. In place, it was a big floppy tent with three outstretched arms. Their team's rock hopper was parked nearby, also staked down to the larger mass of the asteroid. The ship provided power and comm support for the habitat. Lepet warily approached the hatch at the end of one arm. The pin lights for the controls were live. At least Elen hadn't dumped the power then. From the readouts, it actually looked like all the systems were hot, which was odd, too. Had they been testing something? He hadn't dumped the life support either, otherwise there would be frost everywhere outside the habitat. The big orange tent wouldn't have had the same whale-back curve of atmospheric pressure within either. Maybe Tanalu had responded to her alarm. For the first time since Malibu had died, Lepet found herself concerned about the fate of her fellow rockheads. She didn't want to face what was down in the void, alone. Her code opened the hatch. Lepet was mildly surprised. There were two skin suits on the other side of the airlock, their names stenciled on their chests and helmets, Tanalu and Elen. Malibu's had been lost with its owner, the suit bracket standing as empty as a promise ever since. No one had gone for a walk in her absence, or if they had, they hadn't gone far. Lepet stripped down and wiped her skin clear of the gunk that always accumulated during a shift outside. She hated the sticky feeling and the fug like an old suit liner. Once clean, she tugged her blue yukata over her shoulders, belted it closed, and keyed her way onward to the habitat's core. Inside it smelled of people, ozone and steam. Tanalu and Elaine were at the table drinking tea. A third sippy was clipped down, waiting for her. Hey, Lepet, Elaine said. He was small, dark-skinned, grandparents from Haiti. Tanalu, a first-generation Samoan, easily twice Elaine's size, nodded. He looked exhausted. But then he should, she thought. Tanalud had less than three hours of rack time between their last calm chatter and when she'd sent him the alarm. You boys all right? <sighs> Might be, growled Tanalu. Depends on your problem. She took her seat. If you were so worried about me, why didn't you ask? Didn't hear no emergency declared. Elaine nodded agreement. Something was going on here. Lepet could feel it. The two of them were very nearly cross-eyed with tension. This was more than Elaine's ongoing odyssey of disintegration. The thought came in a rush of paranoid fear. They knew what she'd found. Her quiet conscience whispered back, Of course they did. Everything any of them did on company time with company equipment was metered and miked and imaged. Just because she didn't snoop the boy's suit cams or instrument readings when they were out in the hard vacuum didn't mean they weren't snooping her. As rock boss, it was practically Tanalu's job to spy. No, she said slowly, aware she'd taken too long to answer. No emergency declared. It was tank switching time, go for broke. You know what I found. Tanalu answered first. No, actually we don't. He and Elaine didn't even look at each other, a sure sign of collusion. Something's down inside this rock, something someone made once. Someone not human, you mean? There was a catch in Tanalu's voice. Ever read the company man page on artifacts? Elaine asked. His tone was too bright, strangely shiny. Mm, no. Lepet didn't know anyone who had. There's a standing first-time bounty of one billion Tai Kong Yuan from the discovery of a non-human artifact. Fan's word. A piece of equipment whined faintly. She understood their silence now. One billion TKY was fifty times a miner's likely lifetime earnings, borrowing a lucky strike bonus. Whoever could claim that 
would immediately be very, very wealthy. In that special way that only created more money for lifetimes to come. There were any number of people in the company's management chain who would be more than pleased to hide three bodies on their way to claim the bounty, or simply ignore the protests of three lonely, deluded rockheads. Do they know yet? She whispered. Lepet could hardly imagine a worse fate than being bound by wealth to these two. Being dead would be worse, though. Your date is on a batch send, Tanalu said. I cut our upstream comm feed right after you found it. So no one knows so far. We're on an unscheduled maintenance window now, as far as the company's concerned. We've got about two more hours before the routine status queries begin. He leaned forward, clutching his tea sippy close. If you didn't know about the money, what the hell scared you so much, Miss Houston? We have a problem. Just... Just what it means. What people will think. There was someone else here once. Maybe back when Marduk was a planet and not just an orbiting rock yard? It baffled Lepet that they didn't see the gaping, soul-devouring truth. We are not alone. We aren't even the first people here in the solar system. She spread her hands in appeal. Use your imagination. Think what this means to the human race. It means a billion Taikon Yuan, said Tanalu. It means Malibu is still dead, said Elen, unless your aliens can bring him back. It means everything changes, whispered Lapet. Tanalu shook his head. Our lives aren't worth a plugged Xiao, especially now. What else is new, thought Lepet. In that moment, she hated them both for being so petty, so worried, so right. Fine, we send a public broadcast, tell the world what we found. How? Tenlu, again. Our navcom systems are completely self-contained. They lock on a company repeater, traffic goes back to series. Unless we go outside and string up wires, we've got no way to reach anyone that isn't in hailing distance. That was less than 10,000 kilometers plus or minus, depending on the amount of local dust. No one was that close to them, unless they were running black and cold. Lepet's mind scrabbled. Can we message the guild or do a send to all? Everything drops into the oversight queue back on series. Also standard procedure. Elaine stirred. I say we wipe her data feed and destroy that thing she found. I'll lose my birth for destroying data. Lepet was shocked. They were all indentured to the company, but that service could be relatively rewarding, such as being a rockhead, or it might be a lifetime of negative accrual, cleaning sludge filters on Ceres. You could be dead. Elaine's eyes narrowed. Maybe you should try it. Malibu's death was an accident. He came over the table after her, screaming incoherently. Tanalu grabbed at Elaine as Lepet jumped back. She moved so quickly her slippers missed their hold and sent her rolling into the air. Tanalu and Elaine followed, still wrestling as their combined velocity pushed them past her position on a vector for the upper wall of the habitat module. Lepet hurled her cup upward to gain downward momentum. It wasn't much, but she didn't have far to go. Outside, in hard vac, she'd have a line gun. In here, inside a habitat module, people weren't supposed to be this stupid. She made it to the floor as the boys were descending on their rebound from the habitat skin. Her slippers found their plane and gave her back her artificial down. She eyed the arms, locker briefly, but escalating the confrontation didn't seem to be in her interests. Tanalu was far meaner than she was capable of almost anything. Ellen was capable of Houston only knew what, through sheer hopeless desperation. For a billion Taikon Yuan, a whole lot of other people could be killing her as well. They were right. They were both right. Damn them. She wasn't as smart enough to see a way out of this that didn't have her taking a hit, 
The best she could do was minimize the damage. <sighs> Danilo, wipe the stupid data, Lepet said as the other two found their footing. We're running out of time, and such as it is, that's our safety valve. I'm going to head back out to the hard vac and chisel that thing free. Nothing happens without the artifact. No billion Taikon Yuan, no losing it, nothing. If one of us thinks of a way to cash in, fine. We'll all three be millionaires until long after we're dead. She took a deep, shuddering breath. If I decide to fire it into an eccentric solar orbit, Tanalu can give me an infraction notice the size of Bolana on Mars. I'll go back to Ceres and dig sludge, while we all live to be miserable another day. You're gonna throw away a billion Taikon Yuan? asked Elaine. Tanalu turned on him with a fist cocked for a blow, which the big man seemed to barely hold back. Haven't you been listening, even to yourself? I, I always listen to M Malibu, Alan's voice thickened, before Lepet killed him. Dumb luck, Lepet said almost the same instance as Tanalu said. Human error. His grin was deeply feral. It was a frayed safety cable, she thought desperately. They'd both been out in hard vac. Lepet had been slipping a bad charge cylinder out of Malibu's other line gun when the man's cable snapped. He already had minimal velocity due to the positioning jets of the stone burner in his hands. In Malibu's panic, the burner had flared. Or maybe the switch had stuck. That's why he was working with it out on the surface in the first place. His suit's attitude jets fired wildly, sending him into a spin, but they didn't have nearly enough power to bring him home again. The rock hopper had been cold parked at the wrong end of a four-hour launch cycle, so Tanalu wasn't able to scrabble after Malibu. The whole incident grew increasingly muddy in Lepet's mind. All she knew was that she was holding the line gun the dead man should have had on his belt. When Lepet desperately went to fire it upward in contravention to regs and common sense alike, there was no shot due to the missing charge cylinder. That was the story Lepet told herself every sleep shift in her dreams when Malibu came visiting, accompanied by the clicking sound of his suits dry firing after their compressed gas had run out. Sometimes she could hear Alain crying. His sobs became the dead man's breath, returned to torment Lepet. They'd listened to Malibu screaming on the comm until his suit had passed out of range. Hearing his lover's song, slow death had stripped Elaine of his sanity. I'm suiting up. Lepet's throat felt as if it were closing too tight to breathe. Delete the logs and keep them turned off until I'm done out there. Whatever the hell I decide to do. Outside, the vacuum displayed the same knife-edge beauty it always held for her. The deep dark was an eternity of sterile consistency. Lepet followed her safety line around the short, irregular horizon of their rock to her digging. It was blessedly out of sight of the habitat. Spoil marked the edges of her hole, like some terrestrial, rare-bit burrow. Despite her fatalistic sense of hurry, Lepet stopped and did her safety checks. Life support, power systems, calm. Everything worked. Unlike Malibu, she even had her line gun. She headed down her twisting tunnel with its gaping vein of harvested pyrochlor. Even through the rock, Lepet knew exactly where the artifact was. It took her almost 15 minutes of very careful movement to reach the last void. The artifact still sat where she'd left it. She studied what she'd found. It was wedged into a crack in the far side of the void, as if perhaps it had been pushed in from the other direction. Lepet drifted close, the attitude jets, in her suit keeping her station while she studied her goal. Not embedded in the rock, so it wasn't as old as the igneous processes which had formed this chunk of carbonatite. She reached out her hand. Whatever this was, whoever had made it, this artifact had come through far more time to meet her than the human race had crossed to send her to this meeting. It was solid under her touch. There was no squirming, no lighting up, no tiny, toothed alien larvae leaping out. The thing didn't come loose at her tug either, but Lepet had expected that. She broke out her zero, 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 and zero, zero, zero picks, 
and set to work freeing it from the stone. The bindings of time slipped free one grain of rock after another. The artifact wasn't quite as hard to maneuver as the stone burner, though it was damn near that heavy. Forty kilos of mass at least, which meant at that size it was dense as all get out. She pushed it ahead of her, careful not to knock it against any stony edges, and thus leave a betraying trace. Lepette promised herself she would return to the void and use the stone burner to slag the artifact's resting place. As she emerged from her hole, something struck her hard on the shoulder. Lepette lost her hold on the safety line and bounced off the spoil pile. She used that momentum to pivot herself around the unwieldy mass of artifact, trying to bring it before her as a shield. One of the boys was spinning away from her. He held a long arm wrench in his hands, which he was now flailing to push himself off the surface of their little asteroid, as his attitude just puffed. Lepette twisted her head, trying to spot the name on the suit. She felt a cold stab of pain. The stencil read, Malibu? Malibu regained control and warped himself along a safety line. Lepette kicked away from the surface to escape her attacker. It, it couldn't be. It wasn't possible. But the suit. She looked down. Malibu was firing his line gun into the asteroid, using the kinetic reaction to propel himself upward like a missile. It can't be Malibu, her inner voice whispered in answer to her fears. You saw him die. She tongued her calm as the dead man began to overtake her. Rock control, where is Hardvac for? Tana Lu's response was prompt. In his quarters, Hardvac 3. Uh, could you, uh, uh check that for me? Elan's voice broke in. I'm right here. Lepet didn't have a weapon. Not that it mattered much. The way things were going, they might as well all kill each other and save the company the trouble. She drew her line gun and fired suit jets to spin along her axis, seeking a good vector to get back out of the fight and think clearly. She was aiming her shot when Malibu slammed into her. The line gun tumbled out of her hand into a low orbit around 217-496-2078-HJ3. Malibu's helmet cracked into hers. Ellen leered through the faceplate. This close, she could see the stencils were just an overlay. She could have smacked him silly for that stupid stunt. Still, she would be damned before she'd kill more of her own crew. You're going to pay, he howled over the comm. I'm dumping you into the deep dark. Why? Lepet shouted, distracted from her moment of reluctant goodwill by his anger. She tried to shove the artifact at him, but only succeeded in adding to her spin. So you can go home with this thing and die without ever getting rich? I'll blow that piece of crap out the airlock, he said. You owe me a life, sweetie. Ellen swung the long arm wrench again. The torque expended, twisted his body, loosening his grip on Lepet. She tried to duck. She wasn't going to kill again, even if he was trying to kill her first. Her helmet drifted downward, close to Elaine's return swing. Lepet caught him with her free hand and tucked herself under the flailing wrench. That was when she realized they were thirty meters above the surface and moving away from the asteroid somewhat faster than local escape velocity. Neither one of them had their line guns anymore. Their suits' attitude jets weren't going to do it. Malibu had shown them that. Elaine thrashed against Lepet as she tried to think. They had spin. She could kick free of him at the appropriate segment of their arc of rotation and use the imparted angular momentum to return to the surface. She might well bounce, but at least she'd have a chance. He'd be off on a permanent trip of his own, safely out of her way. Or I can release the artifact, she thought. She'd lose a billion Taikon Yuan that way. Pushing Elaine and his homicidal rage into the deep dark would let her be worth half a billion instead of a third. Half a billion she'd never lived to cash in. Elaine thumped on her helmet, scrabbling for the purge valve on her oxygen supply. 
Damn you, you stupid bastard, she screamed. Counting off her degrees of rotation, Lepet let go, the most significant piece of history ever to be touched by human hands. Lepet hugged the struggling Elaine close as the two of them spun toward the surface of 217-496-2078-HJ3. She was afraid of letting go of him too soon. They slammed into the rock hard enough to crack her teeth together. Lepet was mortally afraid of the bounce. Suit jets firing, she threw out her hands and scrabbled for purchase. There were knobs and cracks and crevices all over this asteroid. Elaine grunted something incoherent. He tugged on her boot, tugging her away, even as Lepet's finger snagged on a round lip of rock. Her body pulled upward, the strain of both of their masses stretching at her shoulders. Stop fighting me, you damn fool, she screamed. The tension shifted, and for a moment she thought he'd let go. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Elaine's wrench spinning away. She hit the surface again, rolling over fast, trying to catch a look at him. He was floating just above her, moving much more slowly now. Still... He was leaving, just as the billion Taikan Yuan had done. No! Lepet launched herself after him, slowly as not to overshoot or drag them both into solar orbit, and caught Elaine's arms. His faceplate was fogged, the bastard was crying. Counting the degrees of their rotation, she reached past his helmet and cracked his oxygen purge valve. He became a little rocket carrying them back down slowly enough to land in one piece. As Lepet and Elaine impacted the surface again, their team's rock hopper passed overhead. The ship trailed the safety lines and stakes which had held it into place. That bastard Tanalu must have had the thing warming through the pre-launch cycle since she'd first found the artifact. A rescue, she yelled over calm, but Tanalu didn't bother to answer. Lepet already knew where he was heading chasing after the one billion Tai Kong Yuan she had just launched into solar orbit. Without the rock hopper's power supply, the habitat's fuel cells would be good for ten days, maybe two weeks max, before they froze to death amid the cooling precipitate of their own carbon dioxide. All their calm transmission capability was gone, too, except for the short-range rescue screamers built into the skin suits. She rolled over, her elbows and shoulders aching as if the joints had separated, well, she told the rapidly fading Elaine, looks like it's just you, me, and Malibu out here. Twelve days later, a pair of hard suits made their way through the lock into the fetid interior of the habitat. Lepet looked down from her hammock along the upper wall. She liked to think that the oxygen was mildly better at the top of the minuscule gravity gradient, and it kept her away from the mold which had taken over the floor. Elaine hung inert next to her. He hadn't spoken in four days. Of course, neither had she. A suit speaker crackled in the thick, hard air. You kids alive? I am, Lepet croaked. One of them raised a nozzle. Ah, she thought. Tanalu made it to somewhere useful, and now he's cleaning up the competition. Her death would be worth 333 million Taikan Yuan to him, after all. A pale cloud hissed out. Moments later, she could taste sweet, sweet air. Malibu. It was Elaine moaning. He's right here, Lepet lied, waiting for you. Elaine sighed and rolled over in his hammock. The other hard suit jetted up to her and offered her a breathing mask. Where's your rock hopper? You had her from T T Tailu? The words were hard, so very hard. Followed your suit screamers, and after we showed up in the area to see why Ceres had lost calm from your team, that's all we know. She jetted over to Elaine's hammock, but her suit speaker was still perfectly audible. What the hell happened here? She collapsed back in her hammock. Who knew anything now? What story to tell? Her head wasn't straight and Elaine wasn't good for anything. Lepet struggled to speak again. Human error, she said. 
That's what happened. Human error. This story was originally published in Interzone, January, February, 2010. Mm, a cautionary tale of coming into wealth. As we've seen, I'm sure, in news articles where somebody wins the lottery and is promptly taken out by members of the family that cared so dearly about them before they had purchased a ticket and won a kabillion dollars. Yes, I know that kabillion is not a word. I'm just using it in the case of this example. <laughs> but in Jay Lake's universe here, money is still king. Uh, we, we are humans in our quest for material wealth. Makes me very sad. What are your thoughts on the story? You can leave us a comment or a question on the Clerks World Magazine website itself, or you can go to the About Us page where all of our contact information is listed. We have one more story for you for the month of June 2017, which will be The Waiting Stars by Aliette de Baudard. I love her work, so I hope you can come back and join us and listen. And until then, I bid you a very fond and warm au revoir, a biento, aloha, and every other word that means please. Come back and listen again very soon, and until then, please be well.